Hi. I hope you are still watching and listening. Now let's continue. The Long Road to Revolution. In the aftermath of the Seven Years' War, neither losers nor victors came away satisfied. France lost vast amounts of North American land claims, and Indian land rights were increasingly violated or ignored. Britain's huge war debt and subsequent revenue generating policies distressed Americans and set the stage for the imperial crisis of the 1760s and 1770s. The years 1763 to 1775 brought repeated attempts by the British government to subordinate the colonies into contributing partners in the larger scheme of empire. American resistance to British policies grew slowly but steadily. In 1765, both loyalist Thomas Hutchinson and patriot Samuel Adams agreed that it was unwise for Britain to assert a right to taxation. Because Parliament did not adequately represent Americans. By 1775, events propelled many Americans to the conclusion that a concerted effort was afoot to deprive them of all their liberties. The most important of which were the right to self-rule and the right to live free of an occupying army. Prepared to die for those liberties. Hundreds of Minutemen converged on Concord. April 19 marked the start of their rebellion. Another rebellion underway in 1775 was doomed to be short-circuited. Defiance of authority was indeed contagious. Despite the military conflict at the battles of Lexington and Concord, a war with Britain seemed far from inevitable to colonists outside New England. In the months ahead, American colonial leaders pursued peaceful as well as military solutions to the question of who actually had authority over them. By the end of 1775, however, reconciliation with the Crown would be unattainable. The British began the war for America convinced that they could not lose. As a matter of fact, they had the best trained army and navy in the world. They were familiar with the landscape from the Seven Years' War. They had the willing warrior power of most of the native tribes of the backcountry. And they easily captured every port city of consequence in America. A majority of colonists were either neutral or loyal to the crown. Why, then, did the British lose? One continuing problem the British faced was the uncertainty of supplies. The army depended on a steady stream of supply ships from home. An insecurity about food helps explain their reluctance to pursue the Continental Army aggressively. A further obstacle was their continual misuse of Loyalist energies. Any plan to repacify the colonies required the cooperation of the Loyalists. But the British repeatedly left them to the mercy of vengeful rebels. Another important thing would be the French aid that helps explain the British defeat. Even before the formal alliance, French artillery and ammunition proved vital to the Continental Army. After 1780, the French army fought alongside the Americans, and the French navy made the Yorktown victory possible. Finally, the British abdicated civil power in the colonies in 1775 and 1776. When royal officials fled to safety, and they never really regained it. The basic British goal, to turn back the clock to imperial rule, receded into impossibility as the war dragged on. It was a war for independence from Britain, but it was more. It was a war that required men and women to think about politics and the legitimacy of authority. The rhetoric employed to justify the revolution against Britain put the words liberty, tyranny, slavery, independence, and equality into common usage. Thus, the revolution unleashed a dynamic of equality and liberty that was largely unintended and unwanted by many of the political leaders of 1776. Building a republic With a confederation government that could barely be ratified because of its requirement of unanimity. There was no reaching unanimity on the western lands, an impost, and the proper way to respond to unfair taxation in a republican state. The new constitution offered a different approach to these problems by loosening the grip of impossible unanimity. And by embracing the ideas of a heterogeneous public life and a carefully balanced government that together would prevent any one part of the public from tyrannizing another. The genius of James Madison was to anticipate that diversity of opinion was not only an unavoidable reality but also a hidden strength of the new society beginning to take shape. 
This is what he meant when he spoke of the Republican remedy for the troubles most likely to befall a government in which the people are the source of authority. Despite Madison's optimism, political differences remained keen and worrisome to many. The Federalists still hoped for a society in which leaders of exceptional wisdom would discern the best path for public policy. They looked backward to a society of hierarchy, rank, and benevolent rule by an aristocracy of talent. But they created a government with forward-looking checks and balances as a guard against corruption, which they figured would most likely emanate from the people. American political leaders began operating the new government in 1789 with great hopes of unifying the country and overcoming selfish factionalism. The enormous trust in President Washington was the central foundation for those hopes. Stability was further aided by easy passage of the Bill of Rights to appease anti-federalists. Yet the hopes of the honeymoon period soon turned to worries and then fears as major political disagreements flared up. At the core of the conflict was a group of talented men, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, and Adams, so recently allies but now opponents. They diverged over Hamilton's economic program, over relations with the British, the French and Haitian revolutions, and over preparedness for war abroad and free speech at home. Hamilton was perhaps the driving force in these conflicts, but the antagonism was not about mere personality. Parties were taking shape not around individuals but around principles, such as ideas about what constituted enlightened leadership, how powerful the federal government should be, who was the best ally in Europe, and when oppositional political speech turned into treason. In his inaugural address of 1800, Jefferson offered his conciliatory assurance that Americans were at the same time all Republicans and all Federalists, suggesting that both groups shared two basic ideas, the value of Republican government, in which power derived from the people, and the value of the unique federal system of shared governance structured by the Constitution. But by 1800, Federalist and Republican defined competing philosophies of government. Jefferson's assertion of harmony across budding party lines could only have seemed bizarre. For the next two decades, these two groups would battle each other, each fearing that the success of the other might bring about the demise of the country. The Republicans The Jeffersonian Republicans at first tried to undo much of what the Federalists had created in the 1790s. But their promise of a simpler government gave way to the complexities of domestic and foreign issues. The Louisiana Purchase and the Barbary Wars required powerful government responses. And the challenges posed by Britain on the seas finally drew America into declaring war on the one-time mother country. The War of 1812, joined by restive Indian nations fighting with the British, was longer and more costly than anticipated, and it ended inconclusively. The war elevated to national prominence General Andrew Jackson whose popularity with voters in the 1824 election surprised traditional politicians and threw the one-party rule of Republicans into a tailspin. John Quincy Adams had barely assumed office in 1825 before the election campaign of 1828 was off and running. Reformed suffrage laws ensured that appeals to the mass of white male voters would be the hallmark of all 19th-century elections after 1824. In such a system, Adams and men like him were at a great disadvantage. Meanwhile, ordinary American women, whether white or free black, had no place in government. Male legislatures maintained women's femme covert status, keeping wives dependent on husbands. A few women found a pathway to greater personal autonomy through religion. While many others benefited from expanded female schooling in schools and academies, these substantial gains in education would blossom into a major transformation of gender in the 1830s and 1840s. Now look at the map. In an effort to preserve the balance of power in Congress between slave and free states, the Missouri Compromise was passed in 1820 admitting Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. Furthermore, with the exception of Missouri, this law prohibited slavery in the Louisiana Territory north of the 36 degrees 30 latitude line. The bitter debate over slavery that surrounded the Missouri Compromise accentuated the serious divisions between northern and southern states. Divisions that would only widen in the decades to come. 
Jefferson's long embargo and Madison's wartime trade stoppage gave a big boost to American manufacturing by removing competition with British factories. When peace returned in 1815, the years of independent development burst forth into a period of sustained economic growth that continued nearly unabated into the mid-19th century. Economic transformations loom large in explaining the fast-paced changes of the 1830s. Transportation advances put goods and people in circulation, augmenting urban growth and helping to create a national culture. And water-powered manufacturing began to change the face of wage labor. Trade and banking mushroomed, and western land once occupied by Indians was auctioned off in a landslide of sales. Two periods of economic downturn, including the Panic of 1819 and the Panics of 1837 and 1839, offered sobering lessons about speculative fever. Andrew Jackson symbolized this age of opportunity for many. His fame as an aggressive general, Indian fighter, champion of the common man, and defender of slavery attracted growing numbers of voters to the emergent Democratic Party, which championed personal liberty, free competition, and egalitarian opportunity for all white men. Jackson's constituency was challenged by a small but vocal segment of the population troubled by serious moral problems that Jacksonians preferred to ignore. Inspired by the Second Great Awakening, Reformers targeted personal vices illicit sex and intemperance and social problems prostitution, poverty, and slavery. And joined forces with evangelicals and wealthy lawyers and merchants north and south who appreciated a national bank and protective tariffs. The Whig Party was the party of activist moralism and state-sponsored entrepreneurship. Unprecedented urban growth, westward expansion, and early industrialism marked those decades, sustaining the Democrat Whig split in the electorate. But critiques of slavery, concerns for free labor, and an emerging protest against women's second-class citizenship complicated the political scene of the 1840s, leading to third-party political movements. One of these third parties, called the Republican Party, would achieve dominance in 1860 with the election of an Illinois lawyer, Abraham Lincoln, to the presidency. Towards American Civil War During the 1840s and 1850s, a cluster of interrelated developments. Population growth, steam power, railroads, and the growing mechanization of agriculture and manufacturing meant greater economic productivity, a burst of output from farms and factories, and prosperity for many. Diplomacy with Great Britain and war with Mexico handed the United States 1.2 million square miles and more than 1,000 miles of Pacific coastline. One prize of manifest destiny, California, almost immediately rewarded its new owners with tons of gold. Most Americans believed that the new territory and vast riches were appropriate rewards for the nation's stunning economic progress and superior institutions. To Northerners, industrial evolution confirmed the choice they had made to eliminate slavery and promote free labor as the key to independence, equality, and prosperity. Like Abraham Lincoln, millions of Americans could point to their personal experiences as evidence of the practical truth of the free labor ideal. But millions of others knew that in the free labor system, poverty and wealth continued to rub shoulders. Free labor enthusiasts denied that the problems were inherent in the country's social and economic systems. Instead, they argued, most social ills, including poverty and dependency, sprang from individual deficiencies. Consequently, many reformers focused on personal self-control and discipline, on avoiding sin and alcohol. Other reformers agitated for women's rights and the abolition of slavery. They challenged widespread conceptions of male supremacy and black inferiority. But neither group managed to overcome the prevailing free labor ideology based on individualism, racial prejudice, and notions of male superiority. By the early 19th century, northern states had either abolished slavery or put it on the road to extinction. While southern states were building the largest slave society in the New World, Regional differences increased over time, not merely because the South became more and more dominated by slavery, but also because developments in the North rapidly propelled it in a very different direction. By 1860, one-third of the South's population was enslaved. Bondage saddled blacks with enormous physical and spiritual burdens. 
hard labor, harsh treatment, broken families, and, most important, the denial of freedom itself. Although degraded and exploited, they were not defeated. Out of African memories and new world realities, blacks created a life affirming African American culture that sustained and strengthened them. Their families, religion, and community provided defenses against white racism and power. Defined as property, they refused to be reduced to things. Perceived as inferior beings, they rejected the notion that they were natural slaves. The South was not merely a society with slaves, it had become a slave society. Slavery shaped the region's economy, culture, social structure, and politics. Whites south of the Mason-Dixon line believed that racial slavery was necessary and just. By making all blacks a pariah class, all whites gained a measure of equality and harmony. Pause, 1. But during the 1850s, white Southerners near universal acceptance of slavery would increasingly unite them in political opposition to their northern neighbors. As their economies, societies, and cultures diverged in the 19th century, Northerners and Southerners expressed different concepts of the American promise and the place of slavery within it. Discovery of gold and other precious metals in the West added urgency to the controversy over slavery in the territories. Congress attempted to address the issue with the Compromise of 1850. But the Fugitive Slave Act and the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin hardened Northern sentiments against slavery and confirmed Southern suspicions of Northern ill will. The bloody violence that erupted in Kansas in 1856, and the incendiary Dred Scott decision in 1857 further eroded hope for a solution to this momentous question. For more than 70 years, statesmen had found compromises that accepted slavery and preserved the Union. But as each section grew increasingly committed to its labor system, Americans discovered that accommodation had limits. In 1859, John Brown's militant anti-slavery pushed white Southerners to the edge. In 1860, Lincoln's election convinced whites in the Lower South that slavery and the society they had built on it were at risk in the Union, and they seceded. But it remained to be seen whether disunion would mean war. The Civil War also had a profound effect on individual lives. Millions of men put on blue or gray uniforms and fought and suffered for what they passionately believed was right. The war disrupted families, leaving women at home with additional responsibilities and giving others wartime work in factories, offices, and hospitals. It offered blacks new and more effective ways to resist slavery and agitate for equality. The war devastated the South. Three-fourths of Southern white men of military age served in the Confederate Army, and half of them became casualties. The war destroyed two-fifths of the South's livestock, wrecked half of the farm machinery, and blackened dozens of cities and towns. The struggle also cost the North a heavy price in lives, but rather than devastating the land, the war set the countryside and cities humming with business activity. The radical shift in power from South to North signaled a new direction in American development, the long decline of agriculture and the rise of industrial capitalism. A transformed nation emerged from the crucible of war. Antebellum America was decentralized politically and loosely integrated economically. To bend the resources of the country to a union victory, Congress enacted legislation that reshaped the nation's political and economic character. It created a transcontinental railroad and miles of telegraph lines to bind the West to the rest of the nation. Thus, the massive changes brought about by the war, the creation of a national government, a national economy, and a national spirit, led one historian to call the American Civil War the Second American Revolution. The Reconstruction In 1865, when General Carl Schurz visited the South, he discovered a revolution but half accomplished. White Southerners resisted the passage from slavery to free labor. From white racial despotism to equal justice, and from white political monopoly to biracial democracy. The old elite wanted to get things back as near to slavery as possible, Schurz reported. While African Americans and some whites were eager to exploit the revolutionary implications of defeat and emancipation. Although the Northern-dominated Republican Congress refused to provide for blacks' economic welfare. It employed constitutional amendments to require ex-Confederates to accept legal equality and share political power with black men.
conservative Southern whites fought ferociously to recover their power and privilege. When Democrats regained control of politics, whites used both state power and private violence to wipe out many of the gains of Reconstruction, leading one observer to conclude that the North had won the war but the South had won the peace. Despite massive changes, however, the Civil War remained only a half accomplished revolution. By not fulfilling the promises the nation seemed to hold out to black Americans at war's end, Reconstruction represents a tragedy of enormous proportions. The failure to protect blacks and guarantee their rights had enduring consequences. Hence, it was the failure of the first Reconstruction that made the modern civil rights movement necessary.